Well, good morning. Uh, this is a sermon that I have prepared uh, for Sunday morning, October the 18th, uh, 2020. This is number 24 in our series on studying uh, Jeremiah. So you'll be able to find it later in Right Now Media under Jeremiah Sermon number 24. Now it is taken from Jeremiah chapters 32 through chapter 33. And this Sunday's sermon is about buying, buying real estate. You know, last time uh, we saw in Jeremiah, Jeremiah the hope that God was giving the nation of one day of a whole new covenant and a new song to sing about and a new relationship and a, and a new dance that was coming, so to, coming in the future. And this poetry was written as they went into captivity to give them hope of a better day, that in the days to come, that there will be a, a, a better day. And, uh, and there'll be another king to sit on the, on the throne of David. And his name will be the Lord, you know, our, our righteousness. So there'll be a better king than Zedekiah who's going to end up going into captivity. Now, we, we come to this real estate purchase of all things. So in the midst of that, I mean, they're going into captivity. We have this real estate. I mean, Jeremiah is in prison. Jerusalem is under siege. The Babylonian armies are outside the city. And, and God wants Jeremiah to buy some real estate. Is that really the best time to be investing in real estate, you think? This is an amazing passage, and I love this story. But it's not just a story story. It's a piece of history. It's not some fun made-up story because it is set in time and space history. So let me be back up to verse 1 and talk about this buying some real estate. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. And again, God's pinpointing the exact period of time in time and space history. The army of the king of Babylon was then besieging Jerusalem. Jeremiah the prophet was confined in the courtyard of the guard in the slammer. In other words, in the royal palace of Judah. Now we read in verse 3, Zedekiah, the king of Judah, had imprisoned him there, saying, and this is when he threw him in prison, this is what he said, Why do you prophesy as you do? You know, the idea is, why do you prophesy against me, Jeremiah, like you do? You say, this is what the Lord says. I'm about to hand this city over to the king of Babylon, and he will capture it. Zedekiah, king of Judah, will not escape out of the hands of the Babylonians, but will certainly be handed over to the king of Babylon, and will speak with him face to face and see him with his own eyes. So, so Zedekiah has no excuse. He knows what Jeremiah had preached, and yet he can, he can recite it back. And that's the reason he threw him in prison, but he wouldn't obey God. He says, and I don't like what you preached against me, Zedekiah. He will take Zedekiah to Babylon where he will remain until I deal with him, declares the Lord. If you fight against the Babylonians, you will not succeed. That's what Jeremiah preached to Zedekiah. And Jeremiah knew that's what he said. He said, I don't like that, Jeremiah, when you tell me that stuff. I don't want to go into captivity. I want to win the battle. How come you don't ever preach to me good stuff? And then Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came to me at that period of time. He's in jail and because Zedekiah threw him there because he wouldn't say anything nice about Zedekiah. He says, Hamunel, or Hanamel, son of Shalom, your uncle, is going to come to you and say, buy my field at Anatoth. That's the town where, where uh, uh, Jeremiah was from and his father. Because as nearest relative, it is your right and duty to buy it. No, no, wait a minute. He's in prison for preaching against, uh, not preaching what Zedekiah wanted him to preach, or not preaching good stuff, but preaching the truth, that he's going into captivity, and his uncle comes to dump some real estate on him. I mean, you know, if you think about it, he's got to get rid of this real estate before, you know, Babylon gets it all and uh, destroys the city and destroys the temple. So he's trying to jump it on Jeremiah, who's a relative and who is in jail and reminds him there's a kind of a legal right or a duty for you to keep it in the family, so you need to buy this. Really? You need to invest in this real estate for the future. Not, you know, in one sense, I don't know what, what Hannah Mel is doing here, but he sounds pretty sneaky guy selling off a bunch of real estate uh, that's getting ready to be uh, captured by the Babylonians. And God has Jeremiah buy it. Now, now what, is, what is the teaching there? So Jeremiah says, so I bought the field at Anatoth from my cousin Hannah Mel. And I weighed out for him uh, 17 shekels of silver. So in the darkest hour of Judah's history, 
surrounded by Nebuchadnezzar, about to get destroyed, Jeremiah in the slammer, he's buying real estate from his uncle, who's dumping it on him for for uh, 17 shekels of silver in order to keep it in the family's name. Wow. Let's go on and talk about the question that comes up next. Secondly, in chapter 32, verses 16 and 17, and verses 24 through 25. Verse 16, After I had given the deed of the purchase to Baruch, son of Neriah, now Baruch was a scribe. We'll read about him a little bit later. He also helped Jeremiah write down the word of God. That's what scribes do. But also scribes were legal guys. They could do you know, wills and deeds, in this case, a real estate transaction. So he's writing it up all legal. So he said, after I had given the deed, purchased to Baruch, you know, son of Neriah, uh, to, 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 to get it all written up right, I prayed to the Lord. Because I bought this real estate, you know, God told me to, and then I began to question it. And I prayed, ah, uh, and it's amazing. Ah, uh, sovereign Lord. See, you're sovereign. You've made the heavens and the earth and your great power with your outstretched arm and nothing is too hard for you. So he's tiptoeing around it. Lord, I got a question for you, but I know you can do all this stuff and I know you know everything and your plan is perfect, but uh, is this real estate deal really, really a good idea? You know, see how the siege ramps are built to take the city? I mean, Lord, don't you see the siege ramps? Because of the sword and the famine and the plague, the city will be handed over to the Babylonians who are attacking it. What you said has happened as you now see. And though the city will be handed over to the Babylonians, you, O oh, sovereign Lord, you say to me, buy the field with silver and have the transaction witnessed. God, what are you thinking? Why do you want me to invest in worthless real estate? Everybody's going into captivity. This property is going to belong to Nebuchadnezzar. And you want me to buy it. So the question is, and a couple of things we can learn from this is, is one, we learn a lot about Jeremiah. He trusted God's words even when it didn't make any sense. It's not a good time to buy real estate, Jeremiah. And Jeremiah began to question God. You know, I know you're sovereign God. I'm not questioning, you, you know, your wisdom. But, you know, you did see the siege ramps out there, right, Lord? I, I mean, I know you did. You know, you're sovereign, Lord. But uh, I got, you know, uh, does this, you know, really make good sense for me to buy this real estate right now at this time in the, in the real estate market? But nonetheless, he trusted and obeyed. This is a picture of faith. And believing the future promises of God, even though they look far, 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 far away. To trust and obey, for there's no other way. And that's to me is a beautiful passage. It's like Abraham when he when he sacrificed Isaac. I mean, his only son, who was going to be the father of the seed, through him the seed was going to come. And and like Lord, you want me to, you know, kill him? That doesn't really make any sense because if he's dead, how can the seed? And, but nonetheless, thy will be done. Faith that believes God in spite of what seems to be because God's word is so perfect and his plan is so perfect and your faith is in that perfect plan even though it doesn't look like it's going to work out to be a really good deal. Wow. Wow. That's faith. Thirdly, we see verse 32. I'm going to read verses 26 and 27. Uh, and then jump to verses 36 through 40. And then jump to verses 41 and 42. And this is God's answer uh, as he spreads it out. He says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. He asked God this question. You know, is this really the good time? And he says, I am the Lord God, God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? Now, Jeremiah said that originally. God's reminded him. Now, you know what you said about me? And nothing's too hard for me. Can I make this a good real estate deal? Can I do anything? Do I know what I'm doing? But it's okay to question. But let me remind you who I am. You are saying about this city, by the sword, famine, and plague, it will be handed over to the king of Babylon. But this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I will surely gather them. 
from all the lands where I have banished them in my furious anger and my great wrath. I will bring them back to this place and let them live in safety. In other words, your, your real estate investment is not going to be wasted if you trust me. Years down the road, you bought this for your descendants that they might have a heritage in the land, the land that was apportioned by me to all the 12 tribes, remember? When they cast lots and apportioned the land and, and, and you redeemed that back because I still have a future for all my people. And I'm going to bring them back in. Do you trust me? Do you trust me to invest in a real estate uh, purchase and you can't see the future end of it, but you trust my words? That's beautiful. They will be my people. I will be their God. I will give them a singleness of heart and action so they will always fear me for their own good. And for the good of their children after them, I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Remember last chapter was the new covenant? An everlasting covenant based on an everlasting love. I will never stop doing good to them and I will inspire them to fear me so or reverence me so they will never turn away from me again. That's the future, Jeremiah, and you own a piece of it because you obeyed me by faith when it didn't seem like it would be possible. You trusted me for a future that you can't see. I remember, oh, Abraham never owned the promised land. But Abraham possessed a city by faith that hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He lived for that city. Oh, he spent his whole life in a tent, never had a, had, had a solid roof over his head, but he had a city by faith. And so, Jeremiah, we have that same kind of idea. Jeremiah owned a piece of real estate in, in a promised land that God has promised in the future. An inheritance, even though right now it doesn't seem to make any sense. And that's what he was maybe teaching the people with his life. That, hey, you, that Jeremiah, that crazy guy in prison, you know, he's buying real estate. See, he told us we were going into captivity for seven years. This guy's buying real estate. What's going on here? Because Jeremiah has a hope that they can't take away. He has a future because he's trusted God for his future possession. Anyway, thirdly, the answer. Then the word came to me, Jeremiah, I'm the Lord your God, the maker of all kinds. Is anything too hard for me? Well, let me jump ahead. They will be my people. I will be their God. Again, verse 40, I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will never stop doing good to them and I will inspire them to reverence me so they will never uh, a turn from me again as he looks forward to that day when God will gather all of his people again. And, and be their God. I will rejoice in doing them good. I will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart and soul. This is what the Lord says, is I have brought this great city calamity or brought this great calamity on this people. So I will give them all the prosperity I have promised them. God keeps his promises. Just trust me. Go ahead. Buy that real estate, uh, Jeremiah. In the long term, it's going to pay off. Because I'm going to give it to you as an everlasting possession to you uh, and, and, your, and your, uh, your people. And then we read, uh, fourthly, in verses 33, 1 through 3. See, everybody else is getting rid of the real estate, uh, uh, trying to get out of town uh, because they won't surrender. Uh, God tells them they're going to be destroyed. And Jeremiah is investing in the future by faith. And listen, that can, that can be our lives if we trust God for this, this inheritance he has for us. If we really believe it, the, uh, uh, he gives, God then gives him this reassurance. This is what the Lord says in uh, chapter uh, 33, verse 1 through 3. This is what the Lord says. He who made the earth, remember, who owns all the real estate? Who made it? God did. Okay. Who made you out of that dirt? God did. Everything is his to do with as he chooses. And so, Jeremiah, I want you to buy this piece of dirt my dirt. I made it. I know what's going to happen to it. I know what I'm going to do with it. The Lord who formed it and establishment, the Lord is his name. Yahweh is his name. It is the, the all capitals, which is I am the I am the Yahweh Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. Now, this is another one of those things, unspeakable things, unsearchable things. Jeremiah, I have a future prepared that there are no words with which, in your language, to, to describe what I have prepared for you, the possession I have prepared for you. 
unsearchable, unspeakable things that you do not know. Peter said the same thing. He talked about unspeakable things. Caught up to the third heaven uh, in which he saw things that were were unspeakable. No, uh, Peter was the unspeakable joy. A joy that there's no words to describe in our language. Paul talks about one caught up in the third heaven who saw unspeakable or unsearchable things. There are no words in our language to describe it. So Jeremiah, your, your investment is good, but you can't put it in words because what the possession I have for you is, is so unsearchable, so unspeakable. There are no words in your language to explain what I have for you, but it's a good investment. And you can possess that right now in your life by faith. You got to trust me. And the siege ramps are out there and the catapults and the arrows and the armies. And it's the worst possible time in, in the history of Israel and the darkest hours to buy real estate. And he's buying and illustrate because he has faith. In an unspeakable, unsearchable, glorious future of what God has provided for all those who love him and a new covenant that we looked at last time. Fifthly, we have then in chapter 33, verses 14 and 15, and chapter 16 and verse 17, uh, this affirmation. Uh, again, they're under siege, uh, and he gives them a future hope, and he talks about, see, here it is, the days are coming. See, in the days ahead, in the future, at that time, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the gracious promise I made to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah, in those days, and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line, and he will do what is just and right in the land. At that same time, uh, with this whole new land and this whole new possession, and I bring everybody back, they're going to be a new king. Not like Zedekiah's line that's going to get cut off, but I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. It's going to come from a, another relative of David's. But the Father is going to be God. That righteous branch that will spring from David's line. And he will finally, like all those kings that did unrighteousness in the land, but he, this righteous king at that time, will, will do what's right in the land. And in those days, Judah will be saved. And Jerusalem will live in safety. No more siege ramps. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness the righteousness of jesus christ that came by his shed blood but you see how did that all that fit together they didn't know it they got glimpses of it that that righteousness would be established by a cross and he would shed his blood to cleanse him and make us white as snow for this is what the lord says david will never fail to have a man to sit on the throne of the house of israel even though zedekiah is going to go in captivity and and the kingship is going to get cut off god says no it's not I know a king, and he's waiting in the wings. In the fullness of time, he's going to be sent forth, born of a virgin, the real king, who's going to redeem my people, who's going to be uh, uh, the Lord of righteousness and bring righteousness upon the land by his shed blood. And he's going to save the nations of the earth. That righteous branch. But there's never going to be somebody to fail to be ready to stand on the on the throne of David. He's, he's, he's right, ready to come on the scene in the fullness of time and at that time and in that day. He says, nor will the priests who are Levites ever fail to have a man to stand before them. Also, uh, all the priests are going into captivity, but no, there's another priest I know. In fact, he's a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. His one sacrifice is going to be once for all. And I didn't say all that. But Jesus came as prophet the Word, the preacher, priest, an everlasting priesthood that has no beginning and no ending, and king. I says, yeah, yeah, no, you're not going to lack for a king or for a priest. I got, I got you. I got it covered. Your job is to trust my plan and go ahead and buy the real estate. It's a good investment if you trust me, if you believe on me. And then fourthly, chapter 33, verses 19 through 22, we have this further assurance. And again, God is trying to assure them over and over again to give them hope as they go into captivity, as the city is destroyed and, those, and the siege and the plague and all the horrible stuff that's about ready to take place. They have a hope to carry them through, a hope to carrying them into the captivity if they survive. And the hope that for them to share maybe with their children so they'll have a hope for generations and generations to come if they are scattered throughout the whole world. 
The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. This is what the Lord says. If you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that the night no longer comes at its appointed time, then my covenant with David, my servant, and my covenant with the Levites, the priests, who are priests ministering before me, can be broken, and David would no longer have a descendant to reign on the throne. If you can do away with the sun uh, during the day and the moon at night, then David uh, won't have a throne, or, or David will lack a man to have on the throne, and there won't be any priest to minister before me. That's not true. You see, because those ordinates still continue. I've got a king to reign over the whole earth, the whole cosmos. And I've got a priest who's going to make a perfect sacrifice. And he's going to minister before me. Uh, a priest that is really, really righteous, an advocate for all the people. And he says, I will make my descendants of David, my servant, the Levite to minister before me as countless as the stars of the sky and as measureless as the sound of the sea. See, at that time, I'm going to make those descendants of David my servant, and the Levites who minister to me as countless, a kingdom of priests. He's talking about a kingdom of priests. Countless priests and his servant of David, who is the Christ, the anointed king, exalted to the right hand, who is also a priest, who has made us a royal priesthood. That's what Peter was singing about. You are a royal priesthood. And how many priests has God got? All those that are born again, that he has made intercessors for him. And they are as measureless as the sand on the seashore in this new nation that, that, that he's talking about. This is the assurance of an everlasting king, a, a sur assurance of an everlasting a priesthood, a great nation of priests of every kindred tongue, all worshiping the king and ministering before him, that king that was exalted to the right hand of the Father. And it all begins with just agreeing with God we're a bunch of broken sinners. And then believe in Him like Jeremiah believed. Made a real estate investment in the worst possible time because God told him to. Which is confessing Him as Lord. Well, you're the king. You know everything. I'm going to do it. Doesn't make any sense to me. And he's going to question it a little bit. But he's going to let God be God of his life and do what he said. And he's going to invest in a glorious future that is unspeakable and unsearchable. It's so glorious and so wonderful. And, and again, it's just agreeing with God we are so broken. We are broken people, idolatrous people, and immoral, a sinful people. But He came and died for us. We just have to believe He did for us what He did for us. And it's all of grace. We don't earn it. We don't merit it. We certainly don't deserve it. And if, and if we believe that God raised Him from the dead, and if we believe that our sins are forgiven, then we need to confess him as Lord. And thou shalt, thou shalt be saved. God bless.